The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. Dr. Albert Lee recently became associate professor of music and the inaugural director of Equity, Belonging, and Student Life at Yale University. A native of New Haven, Dr. Lee earned his Bachelor of Music degree cum laude from the University of Connecticut, his Master of Music degree from the Juilliard School, and his Doctor of Music degree in vocal performance from Florida State University. Previously, he was associate professor of voice and opera at University of Nevada, Reno, and adjunct professor of voice at Troy University. Dr. Albert Lee joins me on Zoom from New Haven to talk about his life in music, including his newly created position at Yale. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I have to start by saying go Huskies. Um, You and I both received our Bachelor of Music degrees from the University of Connecticut Music Department. Yay. Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Absolutely. Go Huskies always. (laughs) Now, I read a, an article about you, in fact, in the UConn alumni newsletter that you didn't actually go there to study music at first, that you're going to be a business major. So what happened? I was accepted as a pre-business major, and I had this idea in my mind that I was going to create this uh, dual degree or sort of dual emphasis where my main emphasis was going to be in business. And I wanted the music background because I was thinking Um, I wasn't thinking of performance as a career. I was thinking of potentially um, music business management or something on the business side of music. Um, UConn at the time didn't offer a program, but I was sort of creating my own pathway at that point. Um, When I put into my application that I wanted to minor in music, um, the music department reached out to me. The voice teachers there reached out and asked me to come up to schedule an audition and to come up and sing. Um, I scheduled the audition and I was offered scholarship money to be a major and the rest is kind of history. Wow. Wow. Now, who were your um, primary teachers at the University of Connecticut? My primary teacher, my primary voice teacher was Donald Pyle and his wife, Virginia Pyle. Um, they were my primary teachers. They were my mentors. They were my champions. They are uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal couple um, that I can honestly say changed my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you are a singer, you're a tenor with, uh, may I say, a gorgeous voice and moving sense of artistry. Thank you. Really beautiful. And Thank you've you. had a wonderful career as a classical vocalist in opera and oratorio and recital and liturgical music. So, do you have some favorites to perform? Are there things that, are there roles or are there certain parts of the repertory that really are kind of your favorite thing to do? You know, I I will say this, my performing career has been extremely varied um, in in the types of repertoire that I, the, the, the just the, the breadth of repertoire that I sing. Mm-hmm. And so very often what is of interest to me is what's in front of me at that moment, what I'm working on. Uh, in the moment. And so right now I've got three projects coming up. Um, One of them is I'm doing um, performing as a part of a symposium on the the enduring legacy of spirituals. And I'll be doing two different arrangements, um, a set of arrangements uh, by William Banfield, um, a composer, a Boston based composer, and then another um, arrangement that comes out of the electronic music medium of the 70s, which is um, a piece called Sometimes for Tenor and Tape. Oh. Um, and it was written by by I was uh, written by Ollie Wilson. Mm-hmm. Um, it was premiered in 1976. So I'm doing those two. Um, I'm singing um, a, a supporting role in Bernstein's Trouble in Tahiti in November, which I'm really, really excited about. And then I'm returning to a composer who is near and dear to my heart in December um, with um, the Yale Camerata and uh, with Andre Thomas conducting. And that is Adolphus Hale Stork's um, I Will Lift Up Mine Eyes. Ah. So those those are the three things that are on my plate right now performance wise. And um, that's exciting. 
the thing beyond that, and um, I have to add something to the to the bio you gave. The thing beyond that that I'm doing in in February, I'm doing a short residency at Bethune Cookman University in um, Daytona Beach, Florida, where I will be doing a recital um, that is all Langston Hughes poetry set to music. Uh, and I actually, my very first college teaching job was as um, was on the faculty of Lincoln University, which happens to be Langston Hughes's alma mater. Uh, and uh, he has been my artistic muse for for a very, very long time. And so I try every place that I go in whatever ways that I can to always champion music that, that bears his, his literary influence. Wow, wow. How did you get your start in music anyway? What were those formative experiences? My start in music is is right here in New Haven, Connecticut, um, St. Paul UAME Church on the corner of Chapel and Dwight Street in New Haven um, is where music was introduced to me in some ways and where I sort of found um, music's power in my own life. I grew up um, in a bustling congregation that had five choirs and um, a variety of music that, you know, in some ways is unheard of nowadays. There was gospel music being performed. There were anthems being performed. There were hymns. Um, there was an amount of chant as that was a part of the, the, the liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the male chorus sang quartet music. There was both traditional and contemporary for that period gospel music. Um, and so it was a it was a very very rich musical community. Mm -hmm. Wow! So you have this new job. You're back home, really. You have this new job at oh. Yale University. You have actually a couple of jobs: uh, associate professor of music and the inaugural director of Equity, Belonging, and Student Life. So, what is the mission and the scope of that? That's a pretty specific and and rather unusual title. So could you, could you give a little bit of, sure. a, of an overview? So, so the my job, basically, in a nutshell, is supporting the work of the faculty at large, the work that they are doing with students in the studio, um, in the rehearsal studio, and in the classroom, giving the piece of the education or leading and coordinating the piece of the education that is not necessarily addressed in the studio and and that is all of the the things outside of actually playing one's instrument or or singing or conducting and composing um all of the things outside of that that goes into developing an artist mm -hmm. um and so you know currently on my docket is um uh providing for some amount of um mental health support for students um in other ways it is uh providing connection um cultural connection for some students to to communities around the campus that speak to to uh their identity one of the things people don't always embrace about um, musicians and artists is that we are people first, we're humans first, and very often we leave our humanity at the door in pursuit of, of uh, technical prowess and, you know, maybe even fame and fortune. And the truth is our art only connects to others um, at the point that our humanity leads us. Mm -hmm. And it's that which is in us that connects to a listener and a viewer that is is this sort of intangible power of the arts. Mm -mm -mm. So how's it going? And, you know, do you feel like your priorities have shifted a little bit in accomplishing some of these goals that you've outlined? Do you, feel, do you see this maybe meandering in a slightly different direction? Sure. So part of my part of my strategy anytime anytime I'm coming into a new community 
um, and and working with a new organization and, and a new group of people is to is to learn the lay of the land, learn the system, um, learn the personalities, learn the culture. Mm-hmm. And so I am still in the midst of a what I'll call a listening tour. I spent most of August and the early part of September meeting with. Um, staff members here at the Yale School of Music, getting a sense of their work, getting a sense of um, what some of the challenges that they're facing, uh, and and just trying to understand how their day-to-day lives um, flow. Um, I then started the school year, started teaching my own class. Um, the class I'm teaching this semester is actually related to Langston Hughes. It's a uh, the the literary voice of Langston Hughes in American music, mm-hmm. um, and so standing up that class was its sort of its own um, Olympic uh, effort um, to get that going. And then um, once we got started in the school year, I am now starting to meet with both faculty and students to sort of hear uh, where they are um, and and what their needs are. We have just held elections for a student advisory council who will advise, who will be the voice of students um, to the administration of the school on on issues from soup to nuts. Mm-hmm. And I will work with that uh, with that council um, in, um, they will be sort of my, my sounding board mm-hmm. and uh, they will help me shape um, a lot of the student life activities that I, that we stand up going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, The equity and belonging piece, I will say, um, I think nationally in higher education, everyone is talking about diversity, equity and inclusion issues. And one of the one of the the approaches that I'm taking to it, which might be a little different is rather than having what is a a boastful and um, forward facing you know, sort of diversity language, what we really ultimately want to do is to embed the spirit of equity and the spirit of belonging into everything that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it. I would say it is challenging in the classical arts because by nature, the classical arts have often been um, exclusionary, um, you know, and dare I say elitist. And so we are, we are starting, we, well, we are continuing the process of having those discussions and, and, and finding creative ways to take down barriers and build bridges. Yeah, yeah. So you raise a really good point um, about the need to actually implement these things. And as you say, kind of embed them into the fiber of what we do and just make them best practice, right? You know, um, And you have this experience now in the academic world um, and you also have this experience in the performing world. How do you see some of these tasks, some of this mission, some of this scope with your your current position at Yale and the kinds of things you're doing? How do you think we can maybe translate that to the performing world? You know, how do we how do we embed the performing world, the arts administration of orchestras and choruses and other arts organizations in general, and and frankly, audiences. How do we how do we cultivate audiences that that understand and appreciate and seek that out and feel welcome and included? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I think first and foremost, we have to do a we have to do a bit of soul searching. Um, I don't know that we've always been terribly honest with ourselves about our intentions around these initiatives. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, and the and the soul searching piece comes where we actually ascertain what is in our own hearts about these issues. And what I mean by that is, I think there are times where events, you know, geopolitical events happen where we, where we are, are prompted into action. And then we find out along the journey of starting to act that we may not be as committed to 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 the necessary actions as we say we are, um, and what begins to happen is all of the momentum and all of the the inspiration starts to go away. And when that inspiration and that momentum go go when those go away, we then find out how committed we really are because it's it's easy to 
to make statements in the face of tragedy, um, mm -hmm. it is much harder to go against the grain of um, of the the socioeconomic structure of the country and of the industry when there is when there's no building burning yeah. when there is when there are when there is not bloodshed in the streets yeah uh, and it is it's unfortunate that that that's who we are but that's where the soul searching comes in that's where we we have to be honest about ourselves um you know and asking the question do we really care yeah and you know is is equity what we really want do we really want to diversify our audiences you know do we really want to create an atmosphere where all feel like the the music of a local orchestra a community um you know sort of institution of music uh do we care that that institution doesn't actually reflect the whole of the community yeah um and you know judging by the programming that we see judging by the slate of soloists that we see judging from the um uh administration of the organizations we find out that the rhetoric um and and the and the action are not matching up and so then i think leaders have to say okay this is not matching up you know what are we going to do and so we you know we people are not uh we see i'll say it that way we see now you have um a very powerful tedx talk called when i sing the anthem and it's about your complicated relationship with our national anthem. And mm -hmm. so as a side, I want to encourage everyone to, to watch it because it is brilliant and very powerful. Could you give just maybe a brief overview of it? I don't want to like give it away because it is so brilliant, but I think it's really, um, I think it's worth restating. Sure. So the background behind my TED Talk is that I was on faculty at the University of Nevada, Reno, and um, one of our most famous alums is Colin Kaepernick. Oh. And there was, there was a fair amount of consternation on the campus um, around the time that his protest began. And what's interesting is, um, the, and this is one of those things where, where rhetoric and action, you know, sometimes don't always, don't always measure up. But in, in, in large part, the university, you, you know, sort of prompted by some of its financial backers, in, in no small order erased Colin Kaepernick's face and image from the campus during that time. And, I, you know, it was telling on the other side of, of that and, and with George Floyd's murder last year, how quickly uh the university community um the university leadership i should say not the community the, the leadership in a sense had to backpedal um and begin doing outreach and begin trying to mend fences um you know in, some people's memory is very long and so when you have a long memory and, and there is that kind of 180 that happens within what I think is a short period of time, four or five years. Um, it's just telling about where your heart really is and, you know, and where your commitment really is. But I was, um, I was asked to open the TEDx event, to, to offer a TED Talk um, and to potentially use the national anthem as a possible um, inspiration. And so I, I had to really grapple. There were many people kneeling for the kneeling during the anthem, refusing to stand during the anthem, not participating. I began the first time I ever sang the national anthem was at a was as a freshman at Notre Dame High School in West Haven, Connecticut, and it was for the basketball game. And I sang the national anthem at, at, at Notre Dame High School basketball games for all four years. I actually received a varsity basketball letter on senior night, my senior year. Um, for my commitment to to the team and it's probably one of the my favorite awards that I've ever received in my life. Um, I sang the national anthem for UConn men and women's basketball games for four years um, as a student there. I remember being um, in courtside seats because I sang the national anthem in 
1990, in January on Martin Luther King Day in 1995, when the Yukon women beat Tennessee for the first time and went on to a perfect season where they beat Tennessee again in the national championship game. Um, and so I had been singing it in a sense mindlessly, you know, for many years. And that controversy forced me to sort of grapple with my own sense of patriotism, my own sense of understanding of the country. Um, and uh, what, was, what was remarkable about it is I had to go back to my family. My grandfather is a World War II veteran. Um, I have uncles who have fought in the, in the Vietnam conflict, um, uh, extensions of my family in the Korean War. Um, I have a cousin that was in the first uh, Persian Gulf War. Um, I have another cousin who was in the second um, Iraq War, spent time in Afghanistan. Um, so I have uncles who are and cousin who retired from the military after a full 20 years. So the, the military um, commitment of my family runs very, very deep. Uh, and but I couldn't I couldn't fully sort of act like I don't have a sense of ownership in the country and that when I get up to sing a piece like our country's anthem, that I don't sing it with a full knowledge of, of um, the atrocities committed by the country. Um, and at the same time, the good that the country has been, you know, to, to many. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that very often that the good that the country said it was doing or says that it wants to do was always a front for some pretty ugly things that were going on under, under the surface. You know, this idea of individual rights and, and choice does not necessarily extend freedom to all citizens of the country because some of us are not always um, given, we're not always given the deference to make choices for ourselves and not have our choices questioned um, by, by the law, you know, in a way that is detrimental to our lives. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I have to, I have to grapple with that. Um, one of, I, I take great inspiration from liter another literary figure, James Baldwin, who said, and I'll paraphrase just that, you know, as a, at a, as a citizen of this country, as a lover of this country, I reserved the right to criticize her at every turn when she is not living up to the words of her founding documents. And, um, we have to grapple with, um, frankly, some of the lies. We have to grapple with what we said um, as opposed to what we did and, and, and make it right. And I don't, think, um, I don't think we always are willing to do the work of making it right. Yeah. And, and, and for me, um, not doing the work of making it right um, means that I'm participating in the lie and I can't participate. So again, that that TED talk is when I sing the anthem, and I think we'll probably put a link to it on you know on this interview. But awesome. it's, it is awesome, awesome. Really, it is just powerful in so many ways. Not it to was, mention the I fact this, I was going to say, not to mention I, the fact that you sing in it, and so that's alone is worth it. <laughs> I, I will say it was it was one of the more difficult things that I that I've done. I have started doing much of you know more public speaking over the last seven or eight years. Um, and, but when I do these sort of speaking engagements, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a speech, it's scripted. And so for the TEDx events, um, it is scripted, but there are, there is no teleprompter, there are no notes, you know, so it is completely, um, it is, com you're, it's a free moment. And so I had a lot that I wanted to say, um, what I wanted to share was very nuanced and I needed to be really specific with words. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, it was scarier than any simple performance I've ever given, yeah. but I'm, I'm grateful for the way it turned out. Oh yeah. I mean, it is eloquent in every way. It really is beautiful. Thank you. So you have so much on your plate. I'm almost, um, not embarrassed, but I'm just 
I'm cautiously going to ask, is there anything else that you're passionate about at this moment that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> you know what I've become really passionate about over the course of the pandemic is, um, in some ways, is cooking. Oh. Um, and, and, and food. I have, I have spent a lot of my life, um, very, very, very overweight and, and always attempting to, to lose weight and find health and, and, um, lead a more healthy lifestyle. And, mm -hmm. you know, like many of us in the first couple of months of the pandemic, I gained weight and I was dealing with my, um, um, my mom was very, very ill during the first parts of the pandemic with, with something unrelated. Mm -hmm. And um, I, when I got back to Reno in last August, you know, I you know, decided that I, I wasn't going to do Uber Eats and, and DoorDash mm -hmm. and the rest, and that I was just going to sort of spend time cooking. And what, uh, something that, that many people don't know about me is that I, I'm, as much as I'm very much an American, my father, um, is from Jamaica and I'm a first generation, you know, born American on my father's side, mm -hmm. but I, I haven't always had um, as intimate an attachment to, to my Jamaican heritage as others. And I was mentoring um, a student um, who is from Jamaica, a student um, at a school in the deep South. And we, I was sort of offering him voice lessons and, and opportunities for mentorship. And he was walking through me, walking me through cooking Jamaican cuisine specifically. Wow. And so that was, that was some of what I was doing. And, um, I lost about 40 pounds over the course of the pandemic and, um, and was cooking more and walking more and, um, just feeling really good about being in touch with my own humanity as I was feeling our collective humanity in such turmoil. Um, the, the pandemic was, a, was, I have to be honest, was a good time for me. The solitude, while terrifying and horribly uncomfortable, was necessary for me to just be still, be quiet, and hear my own heart. Yeah, yeah. And it's so interesting. I've been, you know, asking many of the musicians I, I interview uh, about, you know, how'd you do during pandemic? Because clearly there are some very specific challenges to being in the arts, uh, performing arts during a time when one cannot gather and one cannot even rehearse with other people. And so um, it's been really very surprising and very um, wonderful to hear so many saying exactly what you just said was, well, there's certainly are, you know, some obvious downsides. <laughs> there are also those moments, you know, that people use those moments to practice or finish a book or learn to cook or, you know, that there was a redirection of the creative energy. There was a mm. redirection of sort of that personal, you know, edification. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure I would be in this position home in New Haven, Connecticut, were it not for the time that I was able to spend during the pandemic, soul searching, mm -hmm. reading, considering, thinking. By last uh, sort of late May, early June, mm -hmm. I was so out of sorts. I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, I, because my mom was so ill mm -hmm. and with the pandemic, when, when protests began, and I wanted to go out and protest. I had to make the choice not to because it was too dangerous because I was, my sister and I were my mom's primary caretaker and I just couldn't risk, sure. you know, her getting even more ill um, because I wanted to protest. And so what I started doing was reading and, and, and thinking about history. And so I, the, the first thing I read um, was Ibram Kendi's Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Thought in America. And I finished that book with a in, with a group of friends that we were having regular discussions, and then I picked up Eddie Glaude's Begin Again, um, which is a, a a book on on sort of the legacy of James Baldwin's um, writing and and teaching and and um, his activism. Mm -hmm. Then I started reading uh, Angela Davis's Freedom is a Constant Struggle, and so uh, and then after that Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast. <sighs> Yes. Um, and her and her other book, um, the warmth of other suns. And so oh, I'm yeah. consuming I'm consuming yeah. a lot of sort of heavy uh, information and and reading. But what it did was it sort of just grounded me 
in 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 a reality that we don't often like to to admit yeah. if you will because yeah. it's not pretty no. um but i think grounding myself in that reality helped me to see people for who they were mm -hmm. um to see the people who are really trying to do better and be better and be a part of positive change mm -hmm. and people who were talking about positive change but when when the steps to make the change came up, they were resistant and the people who just didn't even want to have the conversation altogether. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it in a sense falls into the three categories that Ibram Kendi lays out in his book where he says you have, you know, the segregationists who were actually racist and you have the anti-racists who weren't racist. And then you have the people in the middle, in a sense, who were assimilationists, but in essence, when you force people to assimilate into what you see and what you think and what you feel, it's actually just as racist as the segregationist. Right. And it's hard to it's it's hard for people to grapple with that truth. It's hard for people to grapple with the fact that, you know, making people think like you do and operate like you do is is not is not the work. Right. And that in on the flip side, that the work of equity is not removing standards to give you know, to make people feel good, but it's understanding that there are different paths to the standards and that the standards, if they are not created by um, a diversely populated group of leaders, then the standards themselves can be biased, um, yes. you know, against certain people. So there's a, there, it is complicated when people talk about systemic racism. Right. That's what it is. You know, the 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 whole rub this past, you know, in the past eight, six to nine months about critical race theory, I have laughed at hysterically only because, it, you know, the the furor is just not real. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not something that functions in the K through 12 classroom. Right. It is rarely something that even functions in undergraduate classrooms. It is it is a higher level you know, sort of theoretical framing of understanding race and how it functions in America. But we don't really want to actually engage the truth. We just want to feel good. And some of this stuff doesn't feel good. Yeah. And if you can't grapple with that and and move forward and, and come to terms with the truth, then we, we don't really want to do the work of change. We just want to, you know, sort of play patty cake, sing kumbaya, and send everybody on their merry way. Right, right. The sanitized version of history. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I have been speaking with Dr. Albert Lee, Associate Professor of Music and the Inaugural Director of Equity, Belonging, and Student Life at Yale University about his life in music and his remarkable activities and accomplishments. Uh, Dr. Lee, thank you so much. What a pleasure to speak with you. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Oh, say does that star spangle 